connection and we are up. Okay, so uh, welcome back everybody. Uh, I was my great pleasure to introduce Anne Jones. Uh, now you see her, now you don't. <laughs> so uh, in the next uh, of our series together that we run ICTP together, as you know, most of you know, with the University of uh, Trento. So this week, I've got great pleasure of introducing Anne Jones, as I said, and you can see already from a heading slide that she's now currently working at IBM. Uh, she was actually previously at the University of Liverpool where she did her PhD and worked for a number of years after her PhD. And she was a, a, a great expert there on basically working on climate applications. And so she worked in a lot of areas of applications, including epidemiology and also hydrology, which was actually one aspect of your past I didn't know, actually. I, I obviously know a lot about your work on epidemiology and looking at climate impacts on disease and disease transmission risk. And then Anne actually, uh, uh, a while ago, actually it was further back than I realized, it shows you how time flies, uh, moved from the University of Liverpool to a new opportunity at IBM that she's going to be telling us about at the beginning of her talk, uh, which is basically a new endeavor, a whole new project, which is being set up during all of the chaotic period of the, the pandemic. So I think they've done really well to get this going. I'm really looking forward to hearing about it. Where in this, this project, they're looking at ways of applying artificial intelligence to geospatial uh, problems. And uh, Anne was just telling me that she's a sub theme leader in the aspect of that project that deals with basically AI applied to climate. So with no further ado, I'd just like to thank you again for joining us, Anne, and uh, I will hand the floor over to you. Uh, just to remind everybody before we start, because I always forget, if you wish to ask a question, uh, please post your question to me in the chat so that I know that you're in the queue. And at the end, I will uh, invite you to unmute yourself to ask the question, or you can specify that you want me to ask the question for you if you so wish. So hand the floor to you. Thank you again, Anne. Thank you, Adrian. Um, yeah, and thank you for the invitation to come and talk to you today. So yeah, my background is, as um, as Adrian said, is I'm a climate impact scientist by training um, and working for, for many years on vector-borne disease modeling um, linked to climate. And then about two and a half years ago, I joined IBM Research, um, focusing on geospatial data science applied to industry problems. Um, and then recently for the past year, I've been working on this new activity called Future of Climate. So scoping this out and then now leading um, some research in this area. So I'm gonna talk about that today. So just firstly to introduce IBM Research. Um, so we are a community of around 3000 um, scientists um, across um, uh, IBM Research's global labs. We work on innovations in science and technology um, from artificial intelligence to cloud computing, quantum computing. Um, and we work on both new foundational exploratory science, um, science that's, um, that can impact IBM's clients um, and IBM's technology, and also science applied to global challenges um, such as healthcare and climate change. So over the past year, we've been scoping out this new research program called Future of Climate. Um, and this has four um, areas of focus. Um, and I will talk in more detail today about the area I'm working on, which is called AI for Climate Risk and Impact. Um, just quickly, the other areas that um, we have activity on are a sustainable hybrid cloud. So this is carbon accounting, um, reducing um, carbon in data centers. Um, we have um, activity on carbon footprint optimization um, uh, focused on supply chains to reduce, um, to reduce emissions. We have some work on materials discovery for carbon capture um, as well. And then we have the, the theme that I'm working on, which is focusing on using AI um, in various ways to better quantify climate risk um, and also um, integrate that information into business processes to build resilience to climate change. And um, so this is concerned with climate change adaptation. Um, and, you know, IBM has clients across multiple sectors from supply chain, financial services, energy and utilities who are all being impacted by climate change and need better insights and tools to build resilience to climate change. Um, 
here it, it also says accelerated discovery for climate impacts, um, which means um, making scientific progress by developing new technologies and capabilities and doing this quickly and at scale. So today I will talk about what we're doing first, some background um, on, on what we're doing around AI and what we mean by climate impacts. Um, and then I'm going to talk about three specific examples, um, focusing specifically on machine learning, how machine learning can improve quantification of climate impacts. Um, and throughout these examples I go through, the first one is more kind of straight out of the box. There's some um, algorithms we can take ready that, and apply to this area. Um, and then um, the other examples are maybe less straightforward and more in, emerging in, in development. So to start on this then, um, from the basics, what do we mean by artificial intelligence? So in you know, popular usage, artificial intelligence just refers um, to the ability of a computer or machine to mimic the capabilities of the human mind. Um, so here we're using AI as a general term to encompass any computing technology which has these characteristics irrespective of the method used. Machine learning then as a subset of AI um, where um, the, the model governing the logic of the decision making or the, the concepts that are learned, um, are, are learned from data using a variety of techniques, including neural networks. Uh, okay, sorry, my video disappeared then. Um, okay, so deep learning models then are a subset of machine learning models um, uh, where um, these models typically require less human input to train because the models themselves are learning um, the features of the data that are important for a particular application. Um, and, you know, the disadvantage then of this is, uh, for example, that um, you can end up with a complex black box model where you're not clear exactly what it's learned and also that these, these models um, can need a lot of data to train. So today um, I'm going to focus on how machine learning and in some cases deep learning can help predict, um, model and predict climate impacts. Okay, so um, as a first, um, a, a first step, how can machine learning, how is it relevant to climate change? Um, so of course, data-driven modeling has um, a long history of being applied to specific tasks in climate science, um, but there's been a particular acceleration over the last couple of years um, due to um, um, you know, the explosion in machine learning being used across commercial applications and um, academic applications as well. And so there's been interest from the machine learning community and from the client science, climate science community in how, um, how we can use machine learning. So this is an example. Um, this paper was from 2019 by David Rolnick and some very high profile authors from the machine learning community looking at the whole of um, various issues around climate change and um, matching up different um, machine learning algorithms for a huge variety of different applications from forecasting energy supply to um, precision agriculture, for example. You know, and they, 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 they highlighted that they seemed like there were various different kinds of algorithms that had potential to be applied across, across multiple areas. Um, so this is obviously that there's great potential, but that to move on from this, we need to understand then um, deeply how we can leverage this. So we need to understand exactly what machine learning can do here um, and understanding from the climate side and um, what the requirements are. Um, and also for this to move beyond machine learning to AI, we want to try and do this in some kind of scalable, generalizable way. Um, to avoid the need for significant manual steps in collecting data and devising models for very specific application areas and situations, <clears throat> you know, which is a traditional way statistical models will be applied. So that's, that's, that's the approach that we're um, taking in general. So now I'd just like to focus um, on climate impacts as opposed to climate science in general and just sort of be clear on some definitions here. So by climate impacts, what I'm referring to are the effects or the consequences 
to natural or socioeconomic systems of climate change. So this might be impacts to geophysical systems such as wildfire, um, floods, droughts, or downstream impacts um, to human health or disruption to supply chains, for example. So specifically what I'm interested in is uh, models that can quantify and predict those impacts in order to build resilience to climate change. I'm sorry, I'm having difficulty with my video. Okay. Adrian, can you still hear me? Okay. Yes, absolutely. Okay, right. Just I'll just keep video. going if the video keeps misbehaving. Okay, right. Sorry about that. Um, right. So, yes. Um, so these models of climate impacts require climate drivers to be combined with non-climate data sets. Um, and the other term we hear a lot is risk. So what do we mean by that? So um, risk of climate for, in the context of climate impacts here is a combination of the magnitude of the climate related hazards. Um, so from um, this could be something like flooding um, with um, vulnerability, um, and exposure. So by exposure, this would mean something like where are the assets that you're interested in that could be at risk of flooding and vulnerability is what is the damage that can be caused to them by that particular hazard. So in order to quantify all of this, we need to combine this kind of information together. So also to clarify on timescales, the approach we're taking is to say that to address climate change, adaptation and resilience, we need to build better tools across prediction timescales. So this may be, um, you know, from short term um, extreme event forecasting, flood forecasting, um, linking that to um, applications like power outage prediction um, through seasonal forecasting for vector-borne diseases, droughts, crops, um, seasonal flood risk and wildfire risk, um, right out to looking at decades and uh, ahead for more on the kind of policy making side. Um, and in terms of impact modeling, um, often um, the same impact models can be used across multiple timescales because they're linked to, um, that are actually um, ingest weather information. And so we can use this, the same um, the same models across multiple timescales, which means we can, if we want to build scalable tools to do this, we can potentially um, take advantage of that. So specifically what we're doing um, in our IBM research program is um, looking across these timescales. So IBM already has some capabilities at short, um, short time scales. So um, the weather company is part of IBM, they op issue operational forecasts um, and some of that data is ingested by um, IBM um, applications, which help IBM customers with short term planning. Um, as a research focus, we're particularly interested not only in improving those predictions, but extending them out to longer time scales. Um, and the research activities that we've got are along across um, this end-to-end -end model, um, looking at improving the climate, the weather and climate predictions themselves, um, building impact models based on numerical simulations combined with machine learning, um, and then taking that through to risk analytics and resilience planning for specific industry applications. So next, I'd just like to highlight some particular challenges with impact modeling um, and then see if we can link those to um, solutions and improvements that machine learning type um, models can, can offer. So some technical challenges modeling climate impacts um, include um, quantifying the climate drivers. So often um, the drivers of these impacts are things like um, extreme rainfall, for example, which may not be particularly well represented in forecasts. So we have to have good data coming into our models. We need to translate often large scale global data sets into um, local information because the impacts are experienced locally. They need to be locally accurate and precise. 
We're often faced with a huge variety and size of different relevant data sets, um, which we need to consume. If we have um, numerical simulation models, we're faced with a challenge of these models being computationally intensive and expensive to run. Um, and then often these systems in reality consist of a lot of different interactions um, and there may be compound effects. So um, we may want to understand the probability of different hazards occurring. So different types of flooding occurring at the same time, and these are, are actually linked, they're not independent. So this system is getting larger and larger in terms of what we actually need to try and model. Um, Another big issue is uncertainty. So as we move um, through the modeling pipeline of taking data and adding more data sets and adding more models to get to some impacts, every step of this um, is adding another, um, another layer of uncertainty. And we ideally want to somehow quantify this in our predictions and include these uncertainties to make sure they're represented um, adequately. And then finally, we want to do robust validation. And this can be a challenge if we don't have, um, we, we may not have particularly extensive continuous set of validation data available to do that. So there's a huge array of challenges that we're facing here. Um, so then what I've done is had a look at, for, for some of these, how can we maybe address these using AI techniques of machine learning? So these three at the top are the examples that I'm gonna to show today. Um, so the first one, um, is concerned with getting better validation data for our models, um, which we can do um, using, um, using satellite data, for example. So I'll show an example for that. We then, if we have um, impact models, which are based on numerical simulations, we want to do some calibration of that um, and do um, uncertainty quantification, uncertainty propagation. In order to address um, the com computational intensity of complex simulation models, um, we can try um, creating emulators of, um, of simulations using machine learning. Um, so this is a statistical machine learning model of a simulation model, which then is much cheaper to run. Um, and finally, although this is not really in the scope of what I want to talk about today, I just wanted to highlight that all of these things um, are improved by having better tools to do our modeling. So we need, um, we need a, a modeling platform that helps us do all this. Um, and on that note, I always I wanted to mention that the way that we're doing this in IBM research is using um, IBM pairs, which is a geospatial um, data um, platform um, that ingests lot climate data and other relevant geospatial data sets. So this is actually what we're using as the um, foundation of the models that we're building. And what PEZ does that helps us is it just makes it a lot easier to deal with a variety of different data sets that we need to ingest into our models, different projections, different resolutions. So um, it, it makes that process much easier so that we can focus on the modeling. Okay, so now I'd like to go on to show some examples. Um, for uh, these examples, I'm um, focusing around flooding. So we are developing um, different types of different hazard models. Um, flooding is, is the number one for us and is what we've been focusing on first, um, just because it, it comes out top um, across you know, different industry domains, um, different societal um, you know, risks and also different locations. Um, so that has been important that we address that as the first one. And we're considering um, three types of flooding. So flooding from surface water, flooding from rivers um, and coastal flooding as well. So to take an example in order to model um, surface water flooding, here we're um, initially focusing on um, background risk. So climatological risk from flooding. Um, but also looking at seasonal forecasting um, of, of flood risk as well. Um, and we can use the same approach to create um, the flood risk maps across those timescales, just changing the data that um, is being used to drive the model. 
Um, and then we're using AI machine learning in various ways to improve the modeling. So if we go into one example, um, ground truth detection. So numerical simulation models like flood models um, contain parameterizations of physical processes. So um, the setting up of a model usually requires some um, tuning of those parameters um, to match observations. Um, and of course, validation of um, the model's ability to simulate past events also requires um, observations as well. So for um, the particular case of flooding, um, recorded extents of floods, flood polygons um, are available for, from a number of different sources for past impactful flood events, but they're not always in a consistent format and the coverage is patchy. It's not always clear, um, for example, the exact time step a timestamp um, that's corresponded to the flooded area um, and the method that was used to create it. Um, if, and if all flooded areas were recorded, for example, or just ones that were particularly impactful. Um, so we found in developing these models that we need a more consistent way to generate that ground truth data um, to use alongside our models. So this is an example, fortunately, where machine learning can really help us. Um, um, in the form of being able to take advantage of um, Earth observation data. So Sentinel-1 um, satellite data has become the go-to source for detecting floods. Um, and whereas Sentinel-2 um, data is um, um, optical imagery, which is, can be interrupted by cloud cover, um, Sentinel-1 uses synthetic aperture radar, um, so that's weather independent. Um, and it detects water essentially by um, detecting the difference in the roughness of um, uh, the surface between water covered areas and other types of land cover. Um, so the starting point of, on our, um, of our work here to sort of generate for, our, for the sake of our modeling, want to be able to generate on demand um, ground truth for flooding um, is this paper um, published by Bonnefiller and authors on the Sen1 Floods 11 data set. Um, so this, in addition to um, a, an application of machine learning to detect floods, also provides a data set which we can use to train more advanced models. So what we're doing here is um, under the category of computer vision. Um, so computer vision um, problems um, consists of a variety of different types from um, classifying the, um, the classifying images, um, the contents of images, to um, detecting particular features within images, to semantic segmentation, which is um, labeling an image by a category, um, and then instance segmentation, which would be detecting different instances of a category within an image. So um, within this um, established kind of recognized field of computer vision flooding, flood detection fits in neatly as image segmentation. So what we want to do is take a satellite image and label it. Um, is this for each pixel, so is this water or not water? Um, so the approach that we're taking here is to use a convolutional neural network um, and conventionally, so CNNs, con con um, convolutional neural networks have three types of layers. Um, the convolutional layer, which extracts image features um, such as edges and corners, um, and then a pooling layer, which does dimensionality reduction on that. Um, you can then have multiple sets of those layers, which allow you to progressively extract um, more and uh, more complex features. So going from edges to faces and full objects um, as you stack up the layers. So finally, um, once you've done that, you then have a final fully, what's called a fully connected layer, which does the final classification that gives us for each pixel on the image a category, whether this in this case corresponds to flooding or not flooding. So in this case, we're using um, a, a, a CNN architecture called UNET. So this was developed actually in medical imaging um, and was designed to address um, the complex um, subtle features that um, are, are present in, in medical images. Um, so this was something that we could directly take and apply to, um, to, to flood detection. 
So here are some examples of what this looks like. Um, so this is the UNET model tra trained on the CERN-1 flood 11 data set and then used to detect flood water for some events that we're interested in. So on the left, we have an example um, of a flooding event um, from heavy rainfall that occurred in Orden, France in October 2018. So this is a particular interest for testing our models because we have high resolution rainfall data available for the same time. And we also um, have flood polygons um, available from Copernicus so we can test our whole modeling pipeline. So on the left, you can see um, in the light areas water that was detected by the AI algorithm before the event occurred. Um, and on the right, um, you can see that uh, flooded areas detected overlaid with the, um, the, the polygons from Copernicus. And the accuracy here is very high, 97.8%. So this is an example of the model, the flood detection model working very well and detecting the flooded areas. So, um, of course, the model doesn't always um, the, the model doesn't always work well. Um, this is just a starting point. So, on the right, as an example of when it doesn't work so well, um, this is for flooding in the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey in Texas in 2017. This is an urban area, and in this case, the model is not able to distinguish between water and highways. So, we're not successfully retrieving the flooded areas here. Um, so the next step for this work is to then try and bring in additional geospatial data sets to improve performance in situations like this, um, where, where the, the baseline model doesn't work so well. Okay, so this next example that um, I'd like to move on to is concerned with model calibration and uncertainty quantification. So in the context of um, surface water flooding, for example, um, we're aiming to predict water levels via simulation that takes rainfall as input um, and uh, along with other geospatial data sets. Um, so um, the model has two different components that need um, parameters to be tuned. Um, so it has for soil infiltration, which depends on the soil properties for a given location and overland flow, which depends on the surface roughness. So we take this information on the categories of soil and land surface from geospatial data in pairs, um, but then these are um, passed to the model via some, uh, by, via some parameters. Um, so these need to be tuned to, um, to match um, past flood events and to get the most accurate model for a different location. Um, but because there's a, a large number of parameters um, uh, to tune, um, this is challenging to do. Um, uh, so really, we want an automated process that will um, enable us to efficiently search parameter space and get um, not only the optimal parameters, but actually some sense of parameter uncertainty as well, which we can then propagate through to our predictions. Um, so one approach that's particularly suitable for this um, is uh, Bayesian optimization. So Bayesian optimization is actually used in machine learning. So it's a method that can be used to help fit machine learning models to um, tune their hyperparameters, but in itself is also machine learning. Um, and it can be applied to all sorts of other situations as, as well. Um, so what this um, method does is um, it learns a representation of parameter space so that it learns a representation of the simulation model's parameter space, um, usually using a um, process called Gaussian process regression. So it's, it's essentially learning a surrogate of the simulation model, um, a statistical model of the simulation model. Um, and it, the Gaussian process is, is chosen because it's a particularly flexible way to represent um, any function. So the method works by building up this uh, model of parameter space that's then used to guide the search process to try and find the best parameters. Um, so it's a bit like the machine learning model is building up a, a mental model of that parameter space and using that to choose which next set of parameters to test. Um, and um, that the way it does that is called an using this acquisition function. Um, so an example of this is the expected improvement. 
So it's the expected improvement based on the Gaussian process model of the model that tells us how, how um, the improvement that, that we think we will get by testing the, the next candidate set of parameters. Um, and so Bayesian optimization is said to balance exploration. So exploring the uncertainty, uh, reducing the uncertainty around the parameter values and exploitation, which is narrowing down on a particular, um, refining the best current solution. Um, and the advantage of doing it this way is that it converges quickly compared to conventional um, sampling methods. And another key advantage for us for interested in uncertainty quantification is that is, this is inherently represented in the Gaussian process. Um, so for example, we can use this to derive a set of best parameter samples that correspond to a specific range um, in the target that we've calibrated against. So how does this look like, what does this look like in action? So this is an example for um, another flood event in Palgar in India. Um, so this is one of the case studies that we've got um, in from July 2018. Um, and because this is early work, this is actually a synthetic example. So we're not here calibrating to a flood detected by the AI model because we have to connect that part in. Here we're just um, calibrated to a, a single simulated snapshot to test the algorithm um, to test if it can find the correct parameter set. So calibration then is performed um, over the whole grid, matching the um, mean um, flood depth for a single time um, stamp. So that's um, it, the similar to the situation where you might just have one single flood event that you're wanting to calibrate against. Um, and the time series here just shows the examples of how the calibration process iterating for a, one specific um, uh, grid point to one specific location. So you can see as, as the calibration proceeds, um, the model predictions in black um, start to um, tune in to match the ground truth target in orange till it matches very, very well, of course, because this was just a, an artificial example. Um, and then the output of that is um, a set of parameter distributions, um, which we can then take and use for our model when we're making predictions. So here's an example of that. Um, once we have a calibrated model, then we have this parameter set, which we can propagate. So that means that we run our simulation model multiple times with these different parameter sets that have been chosen to represent the uncertainty in the parameter space. So this is just an example for the same location of time series running over 10 years. So there's the rainfall time series for 10 years, and then the simulated floods for each of those years as well. Um, the two lines that you see for each of um, for each of those years correspond to the parameter uncertainty. So actually, what we're seeing, in fact, is the default parameters and the calibrated parameters propagated through for all of those years. Um, and then it's interesting to look at how the uncertainty across the parameter values compares to the uncertainty and the difference that we get from year to year. Um, we can then um, take that ensemble that we've generated for multiple years and multiple parameter settings to generate a risk map um, by considering the probability of floods, for, for example, above a given threshold um, by counting the number of the ensemble members above that threshold. Um, so that's this is an example on the right of, of what that might look like. Um, and then we can take exactly the same approach with a seasonal forecast. So we can use a seasonal forecast of rainfall to drive the model and combine that with some parameter uncertainty um, to provide seasonal flood risk maps. So the final example I'd like to show you is on simulation um, emulators. So complex models like the flood model um, that I showed before um, are expensive to run. Um, so that means that um, we're limited um, in the geographic, the size of the geographic domain that we can run for, spatial resolution and the number of ensemble members that we can use to quantify uncertainty. Um, so one area that's active in research at the moment across multiple scientific and um, scientific disciplines is exploring how 
these complex numerical simulation models could be entirely replaced by a machine learning model, which is trained on the simulation data set. So this is called a simulation, uh, an emulator or a surrogate model. So um, it, it's worth noting also, you don't actually need to have the simulation model to do this. If you just have the output of the model, you can potentially train an emulator, which is another advantage. Um, so impact models need to both represent complex systems and also um, consume multiple drivers and depends on multiple different types of data. So our work on using emulators and impact modeling is still in its emerging stage. So I just wanted to show a few illustrative examples here of, of what's possible, um, but we don't have a complete um, emulator of that, of that flood model yet. So this is an example um, from my colleagues in research who um, developed an emulator of water circulation in Lake George in New York State. Um, so here they were um, emulating um, simulations from a 3D hydrodynamic model of um, water circulation um, driven by winds. Um, and the way they did this is to take um, the simulation output from the model um, to um, convert that into snapshots at different time periods. Um, this was then uh, decomposed into spatial modes um, and each uh, using PCA. And each of these spatial modes then had a time series associated with it. So this was a step that's done first. Then they trained a neural network to um, predict the future evolution of these time series. Um, and um, at the final step, then um, in prediction mode is to take those predictions and then combine them back um, with each of the spatial modes um, to provide a prediction of the future um, state of the model. Um, and just to illustrate the kind of um, efficiency savings um, that you can obtain with this kind of technique. So whereas the full simulation with a complex model would take one and a half hours, that forecast then just takes two seconds. So, as I say, in order to, um, if we if we save our computational time like this, it means we can then potentially look at well, what else we can do. Um, we can run a higher resolution over larger areas and better um, explore uncertainty. So, another example from another colleague um, of mine, Eloisa, um, is um, an example where this time the neural network is doing. Um, both the dimensionality reduction that the principal component analysis did in the previous example, and also the dynamic evolution as well. So this uses an example uh, technique, um, an algorithm called autoencoders. It's a neural network technique. So this can um, perform intensive dimensionality reduction because unlike um, PCA, they're not limited to linear transformations. And this reduction is achieved by the neural network by encoding inputs into a smaller latent space, um, um, which is then decoded in to create the prediction. Um, the disadvantage of this approach is that the neural network is, um, is capable of doing such complex transformations that you can overfit to the, the data. Um, which is why um, variational autoencoders were introduced um, to reduce this where they have a particular um, constraints on the, the neurons within the latent space um, to make sure that they're independent. So this particular example based on this model called SINA is interesting, I think, for impact modeling um, because it takes this concept of variational autoencoders but adds another thing, which is to say that maybe we don't need to um, completely replicate all of the simulations. We don't need to represent the state of the system all the way through, um, but what if we're just interested in certain things? Um, so for example, for flood risk, we might only be interested in maximum flood depth over a certain period rather than the flood depth every hour. Or maybe we're only interested in certain locations, not everywhere. Um, so can we take advantage of that to kind of um, to, to compress the model that's needed to, to represent the system? Um, a further feature to note here, as I mentioned earlier, that deep learning models can dif be difficult to understand. Um, so you end up with a black box. Um, 
uh, where you're not quite sure what's happening inside it. Um, so the other question that Eloise was looking at with this work was to say, um, can we make this more explainable and more understandable? Um, and in fact, this Cynet um, model was um, created by physicists who were um, exploring if a machine learning model could um, learn physical laws from experimental data. So in this um, very simple example, um, Eloisa took this model and looked at applying it to um, the problem of prediction of maximum water height um, in a simplified domain. So let's see if I can get that to play. Um, so this is just um, a regular domain that has an infinitely height, infinite height levy here that the, that the wave is breaking against. Um, and the shape of that structure is just controlled by two parameters. And then she looked at whether um, the emulator was able to reproduce the dynamics um, of the, this system as she varied those parameters. And then she looked at what, what if we just want to predict the maximum water height at a certain location, um, can we encode that using this Cynet approach? Um, so she was able to create an accurate emulator of this system um, and also um, uh, do so in such a way that when she looked at this inside this latent space, which ends up with just two neurons inside it to represent the dynamics of the system, you can see them, they're plotted here, um, the, the behavior of the two neurons as the, as the predictions are made. Um, she was able to get a structure out of that that um, represented um, the degrees of freedom of the system. So there was some intuition then that this model had managed to capture the dynamics. Um, but as I said, this is a, is a, a simplified, a simplified model. Um, you know, so it remains to be seen um, if this, um, these kind of approaches can be successful for more complex real world um, impact models with high dimensionality external drivers, for example. Okay, so some conclusions on this and thinking about where this is heading next. Um, so I think hopefully I've illustrated that machine learning can help address some of the key challenges in modeling climate impacts. And you know, just to highlight that this is such an active area, there's such a huge and um, growing range of AI software tools and algorithms and new um, applications being developed across so many different scientific and commercial domains. It's a really valuable area to be involved with. Um, some challenges of using AI um, include the need to have this expertise to understand um, which, um, for a given problem, um, we need to find the appropriate um, solution and architecture. And also, inevitably, um, doing this work, we need to work with very large data sets, um, so we need tools to help us do that. Some exciting future areas in machine learning, I think, are things like knowledge representation, which I've not, I've not talked about at all. So this is moving beyond just the sort of numerical prediction to understand uh, and to build models of what we actually um, understand about a system. Um, explainable AI, which I've touched on, which is a, it's an area of active research at the moment to, to get some insights from um, what the models see. Um, and then automating, this more fully so that we can move from just machine learning to AI and take out um, some of the, the human tuning of, of what we're doing for a particular application. And then finally, just to note, um, what we've found is that we need to um, do careful planning and have many iterative discussions really to start to understand how we can translate what we're doing in research into operations and then on to uh, delivering business and societal value, what we're doing, which is the real target of all of this in the end. Okay, so I'd just like to mention if I could, um, I think it looks like we have time. Um, if you're interested in collaboration um, with IBM, you know, we, we have multiple collaborations um, with universities. Um, there's the IBM Global Universities Program, which you're welcome to look up. Um, we have research projects with universities. We also have internships. Um, so research internships usually for PhD students um, around usually three months, which are advertised on our careers website. And then finally, um, if you may have heard of the Call for Code, um, which IBM is a key sponsor for, 
Um, so the call for code for this year is now open and the subject is climate change. So please get involved in that if you're interested. Um, so thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions and for you to get in touch with me at this address. Back to you, Adrian. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, there's one problem with the online videos is you can't hear everybody <laughs> rapturously at home <laughs> to the end of your talk. Uh, but thank you very much. That was really, really interesting. So I'm, I'm waiting uh, for a question in the chat, but just to get things moving, actually, I had a couple of questions myself uh, I want to ask about. So one was coming back to this um, application to the flood forecasting. And you mentioned at the moment that uh, you haven't yet applied it to seasonal forecasts, but you wanted to do that. Um, I was wondering, when you apply to a seasonal forecast, do you have to go through the whole training again? Because the forecast model that you're using to drive will have its own bias characteristics. So do you need to then that, go through the whole learning process again to account for those? So in a way, you're kind of building a bias correction into the system by accounting for the characteristics of the seasonal forecast? Or do you just use the training that you've already done from, for example, observations or reanalysis and just apply it straight out of the box? Uh, or maybe you do just a traditional kind of bias correction that you apply to the seasonal forecast model before you, you pass it through. I was just wondering if you might perhaps talk a little bit about the strategy that you're thinking of following there when you move on towards yep. forecasting. Yeah, that's a good point. So, so what I didn't mention is which seasonal forecast we're intending to use. So we, we have seasonal forecasts from the weather company, which have already um, gone through a bias correction process. Right. Um, so we're, we're ideally going to be using forecasts that already had those corrections applied. I right. think we would prefer to do it that way because it eliminates something else from the both interpretation stage of, what, of what's coming out of the model at the other side. And of course, if there's thresholds within the model, like there would, you know, there, there often are, you, you actually need the input data to be realistic. Um, so you want to correct all that first before you drive the model. And so we also have some um, work on uh, the team that are focusing more on the climate side on, on weather generation as well to, to further kind of improve the inputs to the, to the models. Right, because you could actually apply the, the techniques separately to the forecast models themselves. We actually use these similar techniques to actually apply the bias correction rather than the kind of the old fashioned quantile matching and so on, where you're only really looking at low order moments. You could actually use some of these techniques, I presume, to have a much higher order bias correction uh, technique now when you're actually uh, applying it to these forecasts. Is that right? Or yeah, that I mean, so I think we still need to do some experiments with the seasonal forecast and see and, and see um, how it comes through and how it would affect the tuning that we do. Okay, okay. So, and also with, with this training, because I'm presuming when you're looking at flood events, I mean, by definition, you're looking at kind of quite low return times, quite rare events. Uh, is, do you ever find an issue with seasonality that you, for example, that the model is trained and you're focusing on floods that maybe have occurred at a certain time of year, and then if you get something that pops up out of season and have you looked at the seasonality of the quality of the should we say the fits uh and the, and the training that if uh, is there any seasonality that comes into the should we say the, the, the performance assessment so i suppose what we're focusing on in terms of calibration of a flood model is are you is sort of calibrating the physical process of responding to the rainfall that we get so we're not we're not really trying to correct any of anything else that's coming out of the seasonality, for example, but it might, it might affect the performance of the calibration. Um, okay. Yeah, so, so we would, for a particular location, um, look at, at specific flood events, but of course then we're just limited to, to those. So it's quite a challenge when you don't have properly continuous data to do this. Okay. I've got a question coming in now, so let me bear with me one second because it's just appeared. So I just find the here we go, and I will pass the floor. Ask to unmute, Elise. You should be able Hello. to unmute now. Yes. Okay. So uh, thank you for a nice presentation. So I want to ask, suppose if you are predicting or if you're doing the model for the flood variation, 
So do you need to go to train your model by each factor which can affect your model, like uh, either group temperature, um, either topography locations, and the other factors? Do you need to train your model by using all of those factors or not? Yeah, so just let me skip back to that. So, so in fact, what we're doing is not is basing everything on a simulation, a physical simulation. So the simulation model itself ingests all of that information um, about like about precipitation, but also um, geospatial characteristics of the location. Um, and then if we were going to create an emulator of this, we would also take these data sets as input as well. So we would we we would use that as training data. Everything that the simulation model consumes to simulate physical processes would would then go into um, an emulation of the model. Okay. Now we have a question from Sebastian. Hello. Uh, thanks for the very nice presentation. Um, I'd just like to know whether IBM is also working on the weather or climate models themselves or say only on the um, climate impact models so hydrological or flood models yeah so the weather company does some weather modeling um, the focus for research activity on the climate side is on AI, AI enhanced techniques so not running simulation models themselves but focusing on on AI methods, um, ingesting um, outputs from um, from models. All right, and so that would be actually weather impact models, like um, not the weather model itself, but you post process the output or you put the output of the weather model into your. Um, artificial intelligence model? Yeah, so it might be trying to, for example, improve the, um, the accuracy of a seasonal forecast um, using some seasonal forecast data, but also some other, um, some other data as well. So, or improving the prediction of extreme rainfall, for example, using some observations, and which will then have, you know, be something that we can consume with our impact models and produce better better inputs to the impact models. Okay, thanks. And just another question. Uh, is there cooperation with universities or public research institutes? Yeah, so we do have different collaborative projects. Um, IBM Research has, has a number, number of different collaborative projects with research institutes, so that's definitely something we do. Um, and there's also IBM has academic licenses for various products, so PEARS, for example, um, you know, so, so yeah, that's definitely something we're, we're actively interested in doing. Cool, thanks. Okay, uh, I had a question that I was asked to ask you uh, from uh, Lorenzo uh, Beltrame, who asked uh, if you could provide a little bit more detail about some of the agencies and organizations that provide your raw data. So you mentioned Sentinel, for example, um, as for a satellite source. Uh, he was just wanting to know perhaps a little bit more detail about some of the agencies uh, that are providing data or maybe the networks within the, uh, the projects that you already have established? Um, yeah, so we'd use a lot of open data sets, um, basically. So, you know, data sets are available on Copernicus, um, reanalysis data sets like ERA-5. Um, these are all data sets that we're um, consuming and uh, pulling into pairs um, to, you know, to, to set up with our modeling pipelines. Okay. Um, last, uh, I don't see any other questions in the list. I just wanted to ask actually, because uh, obviously you, you've got this long extensive experience on the uh, vector-borne disease. Uh, will you be branching out into that area as one of your applications? I mean, I can see a lot of potential for some of these hydrology products, in fact, uh, temporary flooding, uh, temporary water bodies. You have this analysis at very high spatial resolutions. Um, so is that an area that you think uh, IBM might be interested to branch out into? Uh, what, what drives the individual? You can obviously see a very strong potential 
uh, in the in the private sector for the, you know, the the flood forecasting. There's a lot of demand, but what's kind of driving the uh, should we say the end products that you're actually choosing within this this program? So, I mean, what we're interested in as research is working on things that have the, the sig a significant impact. So we we you know we we need to work on projects that have significant economic impacts, but also societal impact as well. So we'd be interested in doing that if the you know those kind of um, those kind of collaborations that we could make would facilitate it. I would say that definitely all the tools that we're building are as generic as possible. So, you know, we can see all the commonalities across different predicting different hazards using impact models. A lot mm -hmm. of it is the same that you need to do. You need, mm -hmm. you need to pull data, you know, and you need to do calibration. You need to, so, so wherever it's possible to build this in generic way that's what we're doing so the idea is then if um, you know if there's some other model that we want to use within the framework that we've built we can pull it in we can start using those ai tools with it quickly and that 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 was the you know that's my vision for this um you know we can then address something new very quickly by just uh just getting the model in there and and and, and going with the data that's uh, already um you know available in pairs ready to ready to run yeah I mean, the, the the biggest bottleneck always with the uh, the applications data is that these time series are often quite uh, short. Now, if you look at something like a, a malaria data set, um, we, we know from experience that you're lucky to have, you know, six, seven, eight years of good data. And that must restrict some of the applications, though. They're just the lack of available data in the area or the sector that you're interested in. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I would say that having worked in um, malaria vector-borne diseases, good. Um, it was a good uh, background for this because it's most maybe one of the most difficult areas in terms of getting that ground truth data. Um, yeah. But yeah, we we are limited. We are limited by the by the data that we can use. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Okay, so um, I think that's all our questions, and we're we're at the, the one hour mark. So it just uh, remains for me to thank once again. Anne Jones for a, a very interesting talk on the, the applications of artificial intelligence in, in climate. Thanks once again for your time. And uh, I look forward to seeing everybody here again uh, next week or next Thursday, where we have another applications directed uh, talk topic where, of basically climate and health. So uh, I think this, this material this week is, will lead very nicely into next week's uh, talk topic. So thank you once again and see you all soon. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.